Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar today for the briefing on our new report, State of a Crisis, Dismantling Student Homelessness in California. My name is Geneva Sum, and I'm the Communications Director for the Center for the Transformation of Schools at UCLA, and I will be your host today. We have a lot of content to cover, so we will move quickly and leave time at the end for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A and we will do our best to answer as many as we can. This webinar is being recorded and a recording will be distributed afterwards. Next slide. We would like to extend a special thank you to our funders, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the Stewart Foundation and the Rakes Foundation, and also to our partners at Schoolhouse Connection and Education Leads Home. Joining us today from the CTS team is our faculty director, Dr. Tyrone Howard, and our report authors, center director and lead author, Dr. Joe Bishop, and co-authors, Lorena Camargo Gonzalez and Edwin Rivera. Our report benefited, oh, go back. Thank you. Our report benefited from the input of many experts in the field, and several of them have joined us today. Please welcome Dr. Susanna Martinez from UCSF, a member of the California Higher Education Basic Needs Alliance. Dr. Aaron Simon from Long Beach Unified, Jennifer Ortiz and Jessica McCaskey, educators from Anaheim Unified, Pamela Hancock from the Fresno County Superintendent's Office, Carmina Perales from the CDE, Javon Wilkes from Cal Youth, and Levi Deathrage from Family Assist. Next, Dr. Howard from the CTS team will provide a few opening remarks. Thank you, Geneva. It is uh, with great honor and privilege that we have the opportunity to share this important report. As Geneva just said, we would first like to acknowledge the tremendous and generous support of our donors. This work does not happen without their support and their willingness to take on some of the more complex challenges that we face in our community. So we are grateful for those donors and their investment in this work. <clears throat> we are also at CTS very fortunate to have an amazing staff, a group of committed, dedicated, young, scholars, thinkers, movers, shakers, who are really trying to help us to understand solutions for some of the most vexing problems that we face in the state of California. And while we have been dealing with some of the effects that we know that COVID has posed, you can make the argument that perhaps there's no greater challenge that we face in the state than the issue of homelessness. Part of what we oftentimes have to come to grips with is that when we think of homelessness, there's a particular image that comes to mind. That image is typically of adults, uh, that image is typically centered around people who are battling with substance issues or individuals who have mental health challenges. We tend to think of men. But part of what this report helps us to re, re sort of imagine or understand is the fact that some of our most vulnerable individuals in the state who are experiencing homelessness are young people, children, our youth, uh, the individuals who are supposed to be our most valuable entity in our states. We have to do better. We must do better. The fact that we're talking about over a quarter of a million young people in this state who are experiencing homelessness is unacceptable. It requires all of our time, all of our attention, all of our resources, all of our care, love, and support. We cannot say that we are a world-class state, yet we have <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of young people who are living in cars, who are living in shelters, who are living on the streets, who are doubled up, who have no reliable place to call home. This report is intended to put a spotlight on a very, very big issue in our state. But it's not just about documenting the problem. It's about what we all can do to be able to somehow remediate this problem. We have to have collective action. Schools for far too long have been asked to solve this problem all alone. It's unfair and it's unreasonable. Schools have to do this with the help, support, input from agencies at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level. It is just wholly unacceptable that we continue to overlook our most vulnerable population, children in this state who are experiencing homelessness. So we are honored today to have some of the folks who are really involved in the work, committed to bringing change, devoted to action, and helping us to find a way that we can somehow dismantle this issue. We want to hope that five years from now that this is no longer a challenge. We want to hope that three years from now this is no longer a challenge. We have to act boldly. We have to act unapologetically, and we have to act <clears throat> in ways that are really centered on what is best for our young people. We did this report in a way that we talked to young people, talked to agencies, talked to the uh, individuals who are seeing this, feeling this directly because they see the impacts that this is having on our young people. As Dr. Bishop has talked about the fact that we are preparing to embark on what is a World Series for the Los Angeles Dodgers, 
and we use Dodger Stadium as a point of reference to think how many times over Dodger Stadium could be filled with young people who are experiencing homelessness, that is not acceptable. So we ask folks who are engaged in this work to do three things, to know, to care, and to act. To know that this is a problem that requires all of our time and attention, to care as if these young people were our own, and to act, to act boldly, to act responsibly, to act thoughtfully, but to act collaboratively. And we think that today's webinar brings together that kind of collaborative spirit where people across the spectrum are thinking, doing, and acting in ways that helps us to begin to recognize how we can no longer accept youth homelessness in our state. California has to be the leader on this topic because we are the number one state in the nation when it comes to student homelessness. We have to find a solution. That solution must be timely, must be thoughtful, and must be responsible. So we're honored, but we are looking forward to the engagement around solutions, around action, around immediacy to support our children. So I want to say thank you for joining us and thank you for helping us to be part of the problem. Thank you, Dr. Howard, for your leadership at UCLA, across our state, and really across our country. And I think you've, you've, you've set the charge for us today um, around knowing, caring, and doing, and acting. Uh, we have normalized homelessness in an unacceptable way across our country, in particular uh, for our young people. Um, so what we did over the last year plus is really answer three research questions. One, how can school systems from preschool to college better serve students experiencing homelessness? Two, what services are available to students experiencing homelessness? And three, what obstacles do students face when seeking support? And we answer these questions uh, by relying heavily on expertise and insights from our colleagues at the California Department of Education. You'll hear later from Carmina Barrales, uh, Leanne Wheeler, I wanna thank Leanne and Mindy Parsons as well for all their leadership uh, to, to tackle this issue for many, many years in our state. So we answered these questions by doing a few things. One, we explored state data around student achievement and Edwin Rivera is gonna highlight some key data points around school student achievement, school climate and college readiness. And we also developed an interactive map which is available on our website at transformschools.ucla.edu forward slash state of crisis where you can find a 58 county overview of some of these trends we're gonna talk more about today. We also conducted focus groups with a broad base of stakeholders, including students, educators, homeless liaisons, community-based organizations, and leaders from the higher education and early childhood sector. And next, my colleague, Edwin Rivera, uh, who's also a co-author on the report, is going to provide, again, a high-level overview of what the patterns that we identified in our analysis at the statewide, at the county, and the district level. Edwin. Hello, everyone. My name is Edwin Rivera. I'm a research analyst for the center and I also served as one of the co-authors on this report. To help put this research into context, I'll briefly be going over some key education data points for students experiencing homelessness in California. At the end of the 2018-19 school year, there were over 269,000, or approximately 4.3, of all students who enrolled in, into schools experienced homelessness. To some, 4.3 might not sound like much, but to put that into perspective, that's nearly enough students to fill the Dodger Stadium five times. This number has steadily increased every year, and given the disruption of COVID, this number is only likely to grow. Next slide, please. For the report, we collected data for both students who experienced homelessness and students that did not. Throughout California, students experiencing homelessness saw alarming educational patterns. State data submitted by uh, local education agencies to the CDE reveals that suspension and chronic absenteeism rates were double that for students who experienced homelessness compared to those who did not. The graduation rate for students experiencing homelessness was 70%. And those graduates, 29% were UC CSU ready. As graphed below, students who identify as being Black or Latinx were most disproportionately affected by homelessness. And even though it's at a more minuscule scale, this disproportionality is also true for Alaska Native, Pacific Islander, and American Indian students. These performance outcomes suggest that we must take a targeted approach in supporting students who experience homelessness to reduce barriers of achievement and improve the outcomes for homeless students. Next slide, please. Displayed here are some county statistics that show some of the counties with the highest number of students experiencing homelessness. Counties with large student populations such as Los Angeles, San Bernardino, and Orange also had the highest number of students experiencing homelessness. But county size alone is not the only factor. For example, as a result of the 2018 campfire in Butte County that displaced thousands of people, the number of students experiencing homelessness grew roughly 312% from one year to the next. While each county is affected differently, students experiencing homelessness in each of these counties 
are facing similar education patterns as shown in the previous slide. It is important to note that we're not blaming or pointing fingers at any county for the student populations, but to bring awareness to the high prevalence of students experiencing homelessness in California. As often discussions around homelessness fail to recognize a large number of children who are attending schools without stable housing. The education data in this report was manually retrieved from the California Department of Education and can be found as part of an interactive map located on our website, which lets you look through the data points that we explored in this report for all 58 counties, also broken down by race. Thank you. And Edwin, thank you for your leadership on this report. I just want to underscore what Edwin said. The purpose of this report is not to point fingers at schools, but to elevate an issue that impacts uh, young people in communities that schools alone, to Dr. Howard's point, have been largely responsible for, which we see as being unacceptable as we think about comprehensive solutions moving forward. So there's a tidal wave of factors um, that we need to consider when we think about the challenges around homelessness, but we wanna highlight two specific factors, um, driving factors to consider as part of our analysis. Um, number one, um, we've seen growth in the number of students experiencing homelessness by almost 50% over the last decade, again, by almost 50%. And as we've heard from the previous speakers, we're expecting this number is actually quite higher under COVID, under COVID but we don't know. Uh, more recently, we saw a record unemployment rate for our state of almost 15%, the highest it's been in 50 years. So uh, we're hearing from the field and we're assuming that this number will actually increase, unfortunately. So we're gonna have more work ahead for us collectively to take on. Second slide, thank you. Another, another challenge that we identified um, was the challenge of not having a common definition around homelessness. Um, now, the McKinney-Vento Act, which is a federal policy, has its own definition and the Housing and Urban Development uh, Division at, with the department, or sorry, at, at the federal level, have, are using their own definitions, which creates issues around who's available for resources. There's even confusion in the field about which definition are we use, are using to, to define homelessness. And a big issue, a big capacity issue, which we're gonna talk more about is we don't have enough people, enough educators, enough homeless liaisons to actually identify students. Um, given the sheer growth, we don't have the people power to identify students and once they're identified to get necessary resources to them to support their academic achievement. Next slide, please. We gave you a very high level overview of seven findings, which are, are in an 87 page report, <laughs> but we're giving you the, the short version of the report today. And we're gonna expand on these findings with our esteemed guests who are joining us as panelists. Number one, current professional capacity uh, to support students impact, impacted by homelessness is inadequate. Comprehensive, targeted and coordinated training, training is needed for all adults who work with young people, including school nurses, office staff, school counselors, school psychologists. Um, and knowing how to identify students and how to get appropriate resources out. Number two, homeless liaisons are struggling. And homeless liaisons, and you'll read the definition in our report, but homeless liaisons are largely tasked with the responsibility of not only supporting the academic success of students, but getting key social services and, and entities to work with families. Um, so they have a, there's a large onus on them to really respond to student needs but homeless liaisons are struggling to respond. As you read in our, in our report, one homeless liaison said, I feel like I'm a one woman band. It's me and the county. Another person said, another homeless liaison, I feel like I'm an ER doctor on call 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, we need more people committed to this issue and more staff and capacity. Number three, my colleague Lorena Camargo Gonzalez is gonna talk about the racial realities of homelessness, but we know that Black and Latinx students are more likely to be homeless. Seven out of 10 in particular students for Latinx are, are, um, represent the overall homeless student population. Number four, this is a, a big finding for us. And we actually, we went out and interviewed students, but students feel overlooked or misunderstood in school settings, which can result in negative experiences. And in some instances, stigmas around homelessness make, it, make schools actually not a safe place for students to be. Number five, better coordination is needed between child welfare, housing, and education stakeholders to alleviate 
barriers for students and families. To Dr. Howard's point, a schools alone strategy is not acceptable. This requires local, state, and federal action across cities, counties, states working in close, in close collaboration. Excuse me. Number six, community-based organization and organizations and nonprofits provide a critical function as part of an ecosystem of support for students. We know that CBOs can get out resources to families quickly, but unfortunately they are left out of solutions or not eligible for funding in some instances, which is really problematic. Number seven, last but not least, we're gonna hear more from our, higher from, from our higher education partners, from Dr. Martinez at UC, but we know that the bookends of education, early education and higher ed are an overlooked yet essential part of, of the solutions. We heard from early childhood providers in California that it is sometimes very challenging to connect with families for young families, but if they do, they can get critical services early, which can actually be life-changing, even, even life-saving in some instances. And when we think about college students, uh, we're going to hear more about the California Basic Higher Basic Needs Alliance, but we know that one out of five community college students in California have experienced homelessness. One out of 10 CSU students and one out of 20 um, UC students have experienced homelessness. So we can't ignore that this is a continuum of work and support involving many stakeholders. So speaking of the state, we're going to start with Dr. Well, Carmina Barales uh, from the California Department of Education. Carmina, thank you for your leadership on this report. We appreciate you. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Okay. And yeah, sure, you could call me doctor. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Um, I just wanted to start um, for all of you who work with students experiencing homelessness, the findings and the information presented in the report and throughout um, the presentation won't be new information, um, sadly. But I do wanna highlight that what's different in this report is that the team at the Center for Transformation at UCLA reached out to the homeless education program here at the California Department of Education and really took to heart um, to make sure to reach out to a number of stakeholders and leaders and make this report more of a tool. Um, and, and really practiced what we preach of doing to uh, doing things with our students and those we serve um, like the liaisons and not to them. So thank you for that. Um, one highlight of the report that was mentioned by um, Dr. Joseph Bishop is um, the disparity in the definitions of homelessness for our students versus the larger population of youth and families who are identified as homeless by the Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. For example, of our mo almost 270,000 students enrolled as experiencing homelessness during the 2018-19 school year, only about 16% of them actually qualify as homeless under the HUD definition and receive HUD services. Our students who are in shelters and motels are considered housed under HUD's definition. And you'll see all of those details in the report. As educators, we understand, and I think we all know that a student in a shelter, a motel, hotel situation, doesn't have the stability or uh, equitable access for academic success as their housed peers. I think it's pretty obvious to state that. Included in the report are recommendations of more inclusive definitions of homelessness that it's worthy to note that are embraced by many federal agencies serving children, including education, um, HHS, Human Health Services, US Departments of Labor, Justice and Agriculture, who offer more, a more complete picture of the reality of child homelessness in America. For years in California, we've relied on the California State Coordinator at the California Department of Education and the liaisons statewide to share the messaging about this difference in the definitions and the disparity in housing support for our students. We're really excited that this report will be highlighting and supporting our message so that more will hear it. Thank you, Carmina. So Apologies. 
Carmina, we appreciate your leadership. And now we're going to transition to Pamela Hancock from Fresno County. Pamela, thank you. And again, Pamela is the Director of Foster and Homeless Education for the Office of Fresno County. Take it away, Pamela. Good morning. Good morning, yes. Um, as a county liaison in Fresno County, um, all of our county liaisons um, support our counties differently because of our capacity and our level of funding. But I think um, really great um, findings and it's our, our voice um, statewide is that there is really the lack of time to fulfill our responsibilities. And there's also the lack of funding. Um, really understand that we never get state funding. We're only getting funded through the federal um, funding stream. And I, I have a story of, so that a liaison was telling me that they went out to um, do a home visit. And what she found was literally a student that was home, housed but they did not have any, they had no food. They had, there was absolutely no furniture. There was not, not anything in the kitchen. They literally, somebody moved out and allowed them to live there for two weeks. So I think when you put that in along with the responsibilities of looking for food resources, housing, clothing, um, either our training and supporting our districts. We don't have the time. And so many of our county li liaisons are doing both foster and homeless along with other positions. Um, the second thing is really, again, uh, the disparity in our funding. Let's take a look at our funding just in my county. Um, homeless funding is about $52 per student. We're doing it by, stu by student. Foster is about $450. That's eight times the funding that I receive for the homeless students. And then migrant is about $2,900 per student. Uh, so not only that, I think that we need, so lack of um, time and lack of resources is what, what I would like to see led for a uh, school site liaison. Every single school would have a liaison. They wouldn't fulfill what the district or county liaison would be doing, but at least there would be a point person that would be able to identify our homeless students and then connect them with resources at, or at least the county or district liaison. So I think, you, I, I think this is an outstanding report. Um, I just want to say this is really supporting our work and CD, CDE um, liaisons state level have been outstanding. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hancock, and for elevating the issue of homeless liaisons wearing many hats in many instances. And I think a lot of your points you make about funding levels is something we're going to tackle when we get the policy implications. And thank you for your leadership and, and for, for going to students and families and asking what they need. Um, Dr. Simon from Long Beach, please take it away. So good morning, everyone. Greetings from Long Beach, California. It is an honor and pleasure to be with you today to discuss this very important topic. I'm in the Long Beach Unified School District. Um, I know that our staff understands that students come to school with a unique and complicated history of events um, that can sometimes lead to homelessness. Our staff also understands that if students experiencing homelessness are not properly identified or if such students are overlooked or misunderstood, their educational experiences and outcomes may be poor. So that said, um, in the LBUSD, um, we believe that it is vital for all staff to receive intensive, ongoing professional learning, even starting with pre-service on identifying the signs of homelessness and students' vulnerabilities and understanding the trauma that homeless students face as well. So for the last six years, I would say, um, our homeless education program has provided more trainings throughout the district's 85 schools for the following staff. Our enrollment clerks, our counselors, our school psychologists, our school-based community workers, our secretaries, our administrative assistants, our nurses, our administrators, and teachers. Um, I believe that teachers are one of the most vital staff to receive training and why? because teachers spend the majority of the school day with students. And if they are trained properly, they will be able to identify signs of homelessness quickly 
efficiently and confidentially in order to lessen students' feelings of isolation as mentioned in the Center for the Transformation of Schools report. Currently, our enrollment clerks receive training up to four times a year, and these trainings can help our staff look for the initial signs, which may include a parent's inability to provide the school with a proof of residency bill. Um, additionally, the enrollment clerks um, are trained to give the parents the option to complete the district student housing questionnaire, and are also trained to guide the parent through the questionnaire confidentially. And the, the questionnaire for us addresses additional barriers to education. So for example, uniforms, school supplies, academic support, transportation, access to community services and counseling. All of our trainings are centered around empathy and compassion for students, right? That is vital. And so via the SHQ, the student housing questionnaire, um, homeless youth are identified for school tutoring needs, homework assistance, free dental and medical programs. And we also have a summer camp in collaboration with the California State University Long Beach, which is specifically for students experiencing homeless. It's a science camp for over 200 students that they enjoy every single year. I can attest to the recommendations mentioned in the Center for the Transformation of Schools report, as such recommendations have indeed helped the LBUSD identify students and families in an empathetic way and they've also received the necessary resources and supports in a timely and efficient manner. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Simon. And uh, thank you to Laura, Roberta, and Giovanni for your, uh, for your questions. I see Elizabeth, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna answer some of these questions during our Q&A period. So please hold tight and really appreciate the, the issues you're raising here. I want to thank Dr. Simon for speaking about the importance of, of pre-service work and just what Long Beach Unified is, is doing now in terms of the training you are providing and to your point, uh, trying to think through how we can spread expertise and, and new wisdom to support students experiencing homelessness. So we've gone from the state to the county to the district. Uh, let's, let's get to the, the classroom level with Ms. Ortiz and Ms. McCaskey from Anaheim Union High School District. Welcome. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, so here's our teacher perspective. Uh, at the beginning of last school year, as part of our yearly narrative unit, we asked our 10th grade English students to write about a core memory. Our students bravely wrote about experiences that had deeply impacted them. Nearly half of our 188 students wrote their core memory about having endured trauma. Their memories included homelessness, extreme poverty, neglect, and abuse. One of our students, who we will call Ricardo, shared about how his family had been homeless for the last year, moving from family member to family member and in and out of motels. As with the rest of our students, this gave us great insight into his life and gave a new meaning to his failing grades and numerous suspensions. Our job is to teach English, but how do you get a student to care about Shakespeare or argumentative essays when their basic human needs are not met? Why should they care about making sure they are A through G eligible if they don't know where they're going to sleep that night? Historically, we teachers enter the profession to share our expertise in our content area, but Jessica and I saw a great opportunity before us to broaden our scope of practice and redefine our job description of educators so that we could meet the diverse academic, social, and mental health needs of our students. And we took it upon ourselves to do quite a bit of research and our own soul searching to feel confident and qualified to do so. One observation we made in our classroom when executing trauma-informed instruction was our students use of maladaptive coping strategies to deal with their traumas. Their gravitation toward self-soothing by misuse and abuse of alcohol and drugs, disassociating with excessive screen time, poor eating and sleeping patterns, self-harm, resulted in a severe disengagement from school. And we wanted to do our part as the adults that see them on a daily basis to help heal some of the pain that was hindering their ability to learn. For these students, Anaheim High School is the one constant in their lives. We wanted to try to lower the affective filter to create a safe and caring environment where students feel comfortable self-reporting trauma, adversities, and homelessness. So we created a classroom culture that flourished with inclusiveness, acceptance, vulnerability, and a lot of laughter. We held dance party Fridays and pulled a gigantic speaker into the hallway every passing period, encouraging our students to recognize the ability music, dance, and laughter have to decrease anxiety. We read stories and novels about characters who had faced and overcome adversity and articles about effective coping strategies. 
And finally, we invited fellow Anaheim teachers and administrators to come to our classroom and share their own childhood experiences with homelessness, poverty, and generational trauma. We, along with our students, were moved to tears by our colleagues' willingness to share their own stories of overcoming adversity. Afterwards, our students opened, to us, opened up to us even more, having felt the overwhelming support of their peers and teachers. And Ricardo, our student who wrote about how severely homelessness was impacting his ability to learn, he wrote a very moving thank you letter. But the change in him went beyond his words of gratitude. He started putting forth more effort in his classes and advocating for the help he needed. Taking the time to focus on Ricardo's social emotional needs has even resulted in marked improvement in his grades. This experience has forever changed our teaching practices, and we have come to realize that putting time and energy into addressing the traumas that have held our students back creates a classroom culture that allows our students to focus on their learning and reach their utmost potential. Thank you. Wow. Um, Ms. McCaskey, Ms. Ortiz, uh, your words are so inspiring and so touching. And um, educators go above and beyond every day, but you have just given us amazing examples of what you've done and, and so appreciate you and what you're doing. Um, and want, want to hear more from you, actually. <laughs> but we'll, we'll stop in, in transition. Uh, Lorena Camargo Gonzalez, uh, co-author on the report and researcher at our center, is going to talk about the racial realities of homelessness. Lorena. Good morning, buenos dias to all of you in Pacific time zone and good afternoon to um, folks joining us across um, time zones in the nation. Uh, my name is Lorena Camargo Gonzalez. I'm a researcher for the Center for the Transformation of Schools and a co-author for this report. Um, a finding that I'd like to highlight further is the prevalence of Latinx and Black youth experiencing homelessness and the need for racially and culturally responsive strategies in education practice and policy. In California, about 87% of all students experiencing homelessness are students of color. 70% of them are Latinx, who make up 54% of the non-homeless population, and 9% of those students are Black, who only make up 5% of the non-homeless student population. Latinx, Black, and American Indian and Alaskan Native students are among the racial and ethnic groups whose rates of homelessness are disproportionately higher when taking into consideration their population size. While I highlight the numbers for these groups, homelessness in the state is affecting all racial and ethnic groups. Uh, within our report, you can find data for racial groups such as Asian, Pacific Islander and groups who identify with two or more races. And if you'd like to see data for your county, you can visit our interactive map um, where we disaggregate this information a little further. So why is the number of racial and ethnic students experiencing homeless significant? Well, when we take a closer look to the data patterns, we can see that within K through 12, youth of color experiencing homelessness are more likely to have poor educational outcomes, such as higher rates of suspension and chronic absenteeism. And they tend to also have lower rates of graduation and are less likely to meet UC and CSU requirements. It becomes clear that one factor in low educational success for students of color is their basic needs not being met. The intersection of poor educational outcomes and homelessness present within our schools cannot be overlooked. We need to further analyze underlying systemic issues such as the lack of access to rigorous curriculum, underfunded schools, high unemployment rate, and poor neighborhood conditions that most negatively impact students of color and which have been heightened now due to COVID-19. In addition, findings from conversation with service providers, educators, and district homeless liaisons revealed that we must consider how racial discrimination and stigmas associated with homelessness often present additional challenges for students and families of color who are experiencing homelessness. Given the general lack of dialogue regarding race and racism and student homelessness, if we continue to not adopt a race conscious lens, we will continue to overlook some of these huge disparities faced by communities of color. As stakeholders in education, we must challenge the deficit perspectives around homelessness and race and racism. And we must move towards asset focused discourses that emphasize the value and experiences that students and families of color bring to our classroom. Now, um, I'd like to turn it over to Javon Wilkes, who is the executive director of the California Coalition for Youth, who will share his expertise with community-based organizations. Uh, 
high. It takes a village to raise our children and youth, and they need this village more than ever. A village of community-based organizations and nonprofits provide a critical function as part of an ecosystem of support for students within families to get support and resources quickly within their local community. Community-based organizations and nonprofits, especially those serving homeless families and unaccompanied youth, provide a great layer of support as their volunteers and staff look and speak the language of the child, youth, and family. When schools, community-based organizations, and nonprofits partner, collaborate, and share resources, urgent needs can be met, and a stable safety net is created to support the emotional and social development of our children and youth. In this village, community-based organizations and nonprofits obtain stories and blended with compassion and passion is the information needed to advocate for necessary resources and policies that support the ongoing needs and development of students within families experiencing homelessness and those students on their own. My homelessness journey as an unaccompanied minor at 14 years old was disrupted by a caring adult on my high school campus, a community-based organization and nonprofit that provided me with the support to reach this point in my life as now the executive director of the California Coalition for Youth. This group is my village, which has only expanded due to the continued support of nonprofits and the people who work for them. Let this information empower you to share, stay informed, and build confidence to make a difference in the lives of California students and their families experiencing homelessness, especially our most vulnerable unaccompanied youth and give them the village they desperately need. I'm Javon Wilkes, thank you. Thank you, Javon, for illustrating what a community and a, a village support would look like um, when we support all of our students experiencing homelessness. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Susana Martinez um, to share some perspectives from higher education. I have a camera on, microphone on. Um, thank you for having me today here on this webinar. It's a pleasure. And first, I'd like to um, I'd like to say thank you to Jerron for um, sharing your powerful story. Um, I know it's a, a story that um, I know. I just I hope that we see more stories like yours in the future of students overcoming homelessness. Um, so I am um, um, part of the UC system. I'm a professor at UCSF and I've been working in the area of basic needs over the last um, four or five years. And um, with the so we, we, with the CSE system and the UC system, we've put together, and the UC system, of course, um, we have our alliance, which we call California Higher Education Basic Needs Alliance. And really what this is is um, it was a group of us about three or four years ago who had been working in different spaces of food insecurity and uh, student homelessness and housing insecurity. And um, while one of us was versed in one area, we weren't versed in the other area. So we um, came together to share our stories and our experiences and what we knew about, um, about student basic needs, which is what we're calling um, housing insecurity and food insecurity and um, technology insecurity today because of COVID-19. Um, so um, in the last couple of years, we've really brought together this family of, of researchers and advocates, and we've been working together, um, you know, at our in our own systems, but also across the state, trying to advocate for more funding for student basic needs, um, and really um, working in the area, expanding our research into the area of housing insecurity, from homelessness to housing insecurity. And, and so there was a question that was posed to me is, how can we um, take what we've been learning about student basic needs in higher education and how can we apply that to, um, to uh, supporting students um, across the state, even you know, K through 12. And I, I think for us, it's been really important that while we've been trying to tackle homelessness, um, it's also very important for us to also try to uh, tackle housing insecurity. And in that way, we feel that we'll be um, you know, preventing homelessness. And so one of the, the things that we've been working on 
um, in the last couple of years with our colleagues across the, the three systems is trying to understand how do we better identify those students who are experiencing housing insecurity? Because if we can identify those students, then we might be able to prevent some you know, extreme situation of homelessness um, you know, and, and at, at any time in a, in a student's life. And so that's where we're putting our energy um, right now. We're learning a lot about housing insecurity. Um, the CSE system did a, a, a report a couple of years ago where they, um, they, you know, they, they, they tried, they came up with a pretty good definition as um, Joseph, Dr. Bishop uh, mentioned earlier, there is no clearer definition on, on homelessness for students. And so the CSE system, um, came together, uh, great researchers there who came together and, and really put their minds together trying to define what student um, homelessness is. And in that way, they were able to estimate um, about, I think about 11% of students in the CSE system um, as being homeless. And so we're learning from them and now we're taking that information, trying to understand that in the, in the UC system, but also trying to um, come up with our own measures of how do we, how do we how do we better define and examine or you know, determine housing insecurity in the, pop, in the student population? So. Thank you, Dr. Susana Martinez for your leadership amongst um, and supporting students at the post-secondary sector. And to all of you educators who have shared your insights and who are continued um, in this effort to support our students in the K through 12 schools. Um, in addition to speaking to educators across California, we spoke to over a dozen youth who had experiencing homelessness um, within their educational trajectory. And interviews with youth revealed the following findings. First, students shared that there's generally a lack of early mentorship and stability, which often fuels a sense of distrust and isolation throughout their educational trajectories. Youth also shared that adverse life experiences have the ability to change their educational and employment trajectory. Events such as death, abuse, traumatic life loss, uh, school equipment, um, and their basic needs not being met. And of course, this has been heightened now due to COVID-19. And this is true for many families across the nation. Third, students experiencing homelessness shared um, that they often lack support that they need to fully be engaged. And we just cannot reiterate how this was already a challenge before COVID-19 and the global pandemic has just exacerbated these issues. And last, education institutions must be more flexible in how we extend educational opportunities for our students who are highly mobile and are constantly moving across state lines, district lines and schools. And at this time, we actually have a youth, uh, Levi Deathridge, who will speak to us about their experiencing, uh, their experience with homelessness. Thank you very much, Lorena. And thank you to all of you for having me here today. So I think one of the main themes that I've heard discussed frequently throughout the course of this webinar is this concept of how what most people would determine as the ACES experiences, you know, the adverse childhood experiences affect a, a young person's ability to pursue their education. And for me, I would say that that initially started really when I was, you know, when I first became homeless at the age of 15. And the reason why I became homeless was because I know there's a lot of heavy stigmatized opinions on how these kinds of things occur. But for me, uh, my father left the home and my mother was at, at the time raising my two nieces and nephews who were my sister's children. And to give you a very brief summary, because I don't want to spend most of my time on this, but my family history is one very similar to many young people from my hometown of San Bernardino. And my father passed away from substance abuse a few years ago. I didn't see him. He was a homeless, uh, he was a homeless addict for the last few years of his life. My mother is still uh, improving, but still battling with substance abuse. And all three of my older siblings are constantly in and out of incarceration, perpetually in and out of rehabs. And the problem is, is that I always like to refer to myself as like the white sheep in my family, as opposed to how other people feel they could be the black sheep in their family. And I think that one of the main causes of all of this is that not only is it affecting my, not only did it affect my personal education history, it affected my community's education history because these are 
community and generational afflictions that have been perpetually uh, per perpetually active in communities, particularly communities like mine, where a majority of the people there are people of color. And I think when we're talking about how these affect your experiences, I was in high school and I'm now in college, I'm 23 at this point, which makes me feel old when I say it out loud. But when I was you know, in high school, people were expecting me to draft a five-year plan and I was focused on where I was gonna sleep for the next five days. And that's really a juxtaposition that is difficult for a young person to be able to maneuver. And when we talk about the homeless liaisons, which it's, it's great to hear some of the good reports from the homeless liaisons around the area. But for me in San Bernardino, I didn't even know there was a homeless liaison on my high school campus until after I had already graduated and began doing this advocacy work. And I think the issue is, is that we are expecting these young people to operate at a level, uh, at a level of uh, productive thinking and, and foresight that is really difficult to maintain when you are focused actively on survival. And one area, you know, all those things from where I come from are, are one part of my story, but where I am now, I'm currently a program manager and youth advisory board chair for my agency family assistance program. I've helped develop youth advisory boards, uh, five now to be exact around the state of California. And I think the true focus that I would leave all of you with is that when you're talking about how we properly address this concern and this issue, youth champions are one of the greatest assets that we all have and they're on all of your campuses they're on all of your classrooms these are young people who with given a little bit of support can become exponentially more productive to their communities and i can guarantee you that when i go into a high school and speak those young people listen to me at 23 far more than they listen to somebody at 40. and it's not because the person at 40 doesn't have great points but when the person who was 40 was in high school, they were still learning how to write on typewriters. And it's just a different world. And I think that we oftentimes don't give enough, we oftentimes don't give enough opportunity and credit to youth champions, because if we allow them to benefit themselves, you'd be amazed what they do for their peers. And most recently, my county had a 100 day challenge, which is a directive from HUD to house as many homeless youth in 100 days as possible. And my county housed 71 youth in 100 days and created and implemented a youth specific aspect of our coordinated entry system along with community case conferencing. And all of that was done entirely by myself and my youth advisory board along with uh, community partners. So if you learn nothing else from today, please empower your young people so that they can then empower their peers because that's where true systemic shifts come from. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Levi, and uh, we want to make sure to, to provide our panelists contact information after the call, if they're okay with that, because um, Levi is an amazing resource um, and I think has, has so much to, to help us think about at the local and, and county and, and state level as we move forward. So thank you, Levi, um, for being a champion for our young people. Um, so shifting to policy implications, I'm going to give you just one or two policy considerations uh, at the federal, state, and local level uh, moving forward, because we want to jump into conversation. Um, we heard this numerous times, just even from our panelists today, but as we think about the federal role, uh, we need a standard definition for homelessness uh, that's not only a common definition, but is also expansive uh, from, the, from the federal government. Um, the HUD definition, the McKinney-Vento definition, as just an example, is creating confusion and again is limiting our ability to get resources to students and families. Second of all, um, we identified in our report actually listed a table of uh, McKinney-Vento grantees from the state through the federal government. Um, and you, you can see a list of these communities, but what's really striking to us, again, is that two out of three students experiencing homelessness are attending school without federal money. Again, two out of three students experiencing homelessness or attending a school that receives no federal money. We're talking about $10 million from the federal government spread across 270,000 students over a thousand uh, school districts. Um, just, just for us to, to take into consideration and 58 county offices of education. So the federal government has a significant role to play moving forward. Second or next slide, please. Thank you, Jack. Uh, we heard from the field over and over again. Um, 
and Pamela shared this as well in her comments, really everybody that we need more targeted funding uh, for the local control funding formula or at least the state level. Right now we have no dedicated state money uh, for students experiencing homelessness. And many of our counties and districts and schools have creatively figured out how to pull together multiple roles for folks uh, based on existing funding. But we heard also the need for a, a local site liaison, which would be powerful. Um, but we need, we need state money and federal money to do some of this work, even if the training is happening. Uh, number two, we need to continue to invest um, in our longitudinal data system. That system is being built now, so please weigh in with the state uh, to let them know how you want to prioritize um, the educational trajectory and success of students experiencing homelessness and bro more broadly, um, vulnerable student populations. When we shift to the, next slide please, thank you, to the city and local level, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and I think Levi just gave a great, great example in San Bernardino County um, of what they're doing. But we need to work across districts, cities, and county agencies, again, between education, housing, and health agencies to provide and coordinate access to resources for students and families experiencing homelessness. There are a lot of after-school options and affordable housing op options we should consider, including rapid rehousing, which the state has prioritized for, for college students, but we need um, more affordable housing options for, for all families and young people. Last but not least, at the district level, so we heard in, in our focus groups and interviews as well that uh, districts have a great opportunity to align or prioritize students experiencing homelessness with their local control accountability plan, which is again the plan um, that districts and counties and even charters have to develop uh, related to the new state funding formula. Um, but there's an opportunity to be much more deliberate and explicit about how we prioritize the success of students experiencing homelessness. And then the last two pieces, there was a question about common district-wide strategies um, and best practices. We hope to move forward with the Department of Education and with all of you on this call actually to document best practices. We heard some amazing stories which are highlighted in the report, but we'd like to go deeper to, uh, to share and develop and elevate uh, district-wide strategies and practices. And the California Department of Education has many of these available and even on our resources page, but we need to do more, in particular in our rural communities where, uniques are need, where uh, needs are, are unique and there might not be as much services or resources to consider. And last but not least, we, we see an opportunity to, to organize or orient the work around the California MTSS framework, uh, which is really the idea that schools need to be built around the needs and learning interests of students experiencing homelessness, which many of our educators and, and young people and leaders have been encouraging us to do today on the call. So last but not least, here's, here's the key takeaway. So Javon said, it takes a village, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Howard said, uh, a schools alone strategy is inadequate, right? Uh, the big takeaway for us is this takes a system, a multi-pronged system, a multi-pronged approach and immediate action to be resolved at the local, state and federal level involving public and, and private partners at the end of the day. And we, we can do much better and we need, we need to do better. Our young people deserve it. So shifting to, to q and I wanna again, thank our panelists for their comments and uh, they're really moving remarks, honestly, and for sharing their stories. And we want to open it up to you um, moving forward. I think there, there was one question. So we talked about best practices. Um, also a question about faith-based institutions. I don't know if one of our panelists would like to speak to the role of faith-based institutions in addressing this, this complex issue around uh, student homelessness. Wonder if our county or district folks want to speak to that or our state folks. I just wanted to share that um, in our trainings where we work with um, our liaisons and how to spread this message about what the definition is and how to identify students. One of the collaborations and one of the strategies is to reach out to your faith based organizations, um, whether it's for um, food pantries, um, things like that, um, training them in understanding the definition. The more we share what the definition of a student experiencing homelessness, the easier it is to identify them. Uh, we, another strategy with faith-based communities is 
they often have youth groups and you know we heard from Levi today and talking about you know um, a village from Javon um, add to your village um, you know youth and peers and bringing each other up I keep seeing that in the chat um, you know moving from peer pressure to peer um, support um, whatever whatever way that we can um, do that is is something that's encouraged as well Thanks, Ms. Perales. Thanks, Carmina. Appreciate that. Anybody want to add? Okay. I think we have. Oh, time sorry. To... Really oh, quick, Joe. Yeah. Um, I think um, following up from the um, from the chat, if if there's anybody out there who's who is thinking, I want to do more, whether you're faith based, a parent, um, somebody in a school. Uh, you can visit our website and the way that the, the program is structured in California is that we have county office liaisons and coordinators. So visit our website, find out who your county liaison or coordinator is for homelessness and reach out to them and say, I want to help. How can I help? Who is my district liaison? I'm in XYZ school. Um, how do I find out how to connect to them? Um, our county coordinators would love to hear from all of you and find out, you know, that you want to help. Um, if you are a partner in a shelter or a transitional shelter or support students in other ways, um, they would love to hear from you and have many ways of either sharing their training or resources and have another partner locally. Thanks, Carmina. And, and there were some some um, some great questions about peer based support. No, we did not get into the role of peers specifically, um, but that's a great question and, and definitely worth pursuing in future research and future work. And Kelly Wiley from the Santa Clara County Office of Ed, thank you for highlighting this resource. We want to look more into that. Um, John, thank you for highlighting your young adult program. Um, and then in the zero to five space, this also gets to our best practices. We want to focus more on this space because it's so critical. Um, and then actually let's let's go to, for the sake of time, I know we're almost at, at noon. Um, we're gonna send a follow-up, Geneva, I don't know if you'd like to talk about follow-up items and then Dr. Howard with the, the final word today. Sure, so thank you all for your questions. Um, a lot of you are asking for links, um, resources, ways that you can help, and we will be sending a lot of those follow-up uh, links and resources in a follow-up email. You will also get the recording from this webinar, um, as well as a link to the presentation. And so um, I'm seeing a lot of questions in the Q&A. We've tried to answer a few um, in the, in the Q&A uh, through text as we've been going through. Um, I've seen some questions come into the sidebar. Um, and I think maybe just one more, if we have time, Joe, um, what districts in California are doing a good job at serving students um, experiencing homelessness? Maybe a, a bright spot mm -hmm. or a success story, or if you wanna to speak to future, um, future work in that area. Well, there, there's many, I'm sure Carmina and our friends at the California Department of Education could list five. Uh, we highlighted a number in, in our report of how homeless liaisons are doing really incredible work. Uh, which is maybe a teaser to read the report, but um, also we did hear just as a quick example in Anaheim, uh, one door. So there's a partnership that's existed between the elementary school district, the county liaison, even the county in Orange County for over 20 years. And they call it one door for a reason. The goal is to get services uh, and to streamline efforts through one place so families don't have to complete paperwork in multiple places. So we know there are examples like that across the state, I'm sure. Many of us could actually highlight, if we had more time, we could go there, but we are really interested in working with you all as a next step to highlight more of these best practices and models and, and to elevate good work happening. Um, so that that is another next step that we hope you'll be a part of that work. And I'm gonna to transition to Dr. Howard for the final word here. Thank you, Joe. I just wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. There's a lot of really valuable information here. I could listen for another hour or so. Levi, you were phenomenal. Javon, you were outstanding. Uh, Dr. Simon, Ms. Ortiz, Ms. McCaskey, everyone, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, part of what we have to do now is do what Joe just mentioned about reaching out to county coordinators, uh, or communicating with our homeless, uh, homeless liaisons, uh, talking to our school boards, our superintendents, our, our elected officials, 
sending emails, writing letters uh, for more funding here. Uh, I can't say let us not forget about the fact that we're talking about 269,000 young people. That would be the seventh largest district in the entire country if the homeless population here in California were a district by itself. Let us not forget the racial realities that, that have been addressed so eloquently by, uh, by Lorena. Though the report doesn't address this, I do not want us to lose sight of the fact that the LGBTQ population is oftentimes disproportionately represent when it comes to homelessness as well. And that requires some additional work. Uh, let's also not lose sight of the mental health sort of ramifications here because they're significant, they're major. So at the end of the day, here's, here's what it comes down to. We need lots of efforts, but two things I want us to take away is that our financial investments in Homeless liaisons are critical. We need financial supports at multiple levels. And we also need a change in mental models to not look at young people who are experiencing homelessness through the deficit lens like Lorena spoke to. We have to see their resilience. We have to see their determination. We have to see their ongoing desire to be the best they can be under the circumstances they're in. So now we have to act. Uh, we've shared lots of information. We look forward to more ongoing partnership, collaboration. Uh, this is an example of how we come together uh, to begin to shine the spotlight and then begin to act in bold, collaborative and caring ways. So I wanna thank everyone for coming out today. Uh, let's roll our sleeves up. Uh, let's get to work or let's continue to work, I should say, because there are a, a lot of young people who are waiting for us to respond. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much.